corner of the sea on the coast of Africa that is part of the desert. It looks like a no man's land. Its wild symmetry gives the impression of geographic mismanagement, an absence of boundaries and distances. But nothing in the desert is accidental. Nothing is chaotic or left to the whims of time. It's a perfect embrace, a communion of sand and water in dunes that head toward the sea from the heart of the continent. The waters off the northern coast of Mauritania, at the same latitude as the Sahel, is one of the richest fishing areas in the world. Over the past 30 years, with the complicity of the local government, enormous commercial fishing ships sailing under international flags have exhausted these waters. At the same time, all along the coast, from Nouakchott to Nouadhibou, thousands of men earn their livings by traditional fishing methods in direct competition with the large industrial fishing ships. is the story of the lives of some of these men and women on the Mauritanian coast. My name is Bamba Fall. I was born in a fishing village in the south of Mauritania. When I first came to Nouakchott in 1960, it had a population of 3,000. I've spent the past 30 years of my life in this place, Nouakchott port, the heart of traditional fishing in Mauritania. The port is a universe in itself, a cooperative world of men who work for ourselves without any outside help, facing alone the adventure of the sea. My father was a fisherman also. He worked for a French colonel who taught me how to speak French. I had a knack for languages. That and my obsession with social problems helped to make me the leader of the fishermen's union. Join me and we will approach the heart of the men of the sea. From the early hours in the morning, the crews prepare to go fishing. Most of the Mauritanian fishermen are black and are originally from the south of the country and from Senegal. Until a few years ago, the upper classes considered fish a vulgar food and no one ate it. Today, fish is a part of everyone's diet and has become big business. Despite the good situation right now, traditional fishermen live on the edge. We are considered an inferior caste within a society dominated by Arabs. The sea produces and the sea is fished out. But the distribution of profits and suffering is unjust. My friend Ibrahim Uld Mbarek has captained fishing ships since he was 21. Today, he goes out to sea again with his crew after several days in dry dock due to a serious accident. The fishing takes place not far from shore. As they sail, the men scan the horizon in search of schools of fish. When they spot one, they throw their nets over and make a perfect circle, creating a bell effect around the school and trapping the fish inside. While the main crew works from the pinnace, a second boat pulls the other end of the net by motor. It has to be a quick and forceful action so the fish don't escape. Throughout the workday, this activity is repeated over and over again until they reach their goal or drop from exhaustion. This time they had no luck. The net was thrown too late and the fish had time to get away. 
But the day is long and they will keep trying. Only a few years ago, this place didn't exist. Mauritania's economy was based on mining and shepherding in the interior. The decline in the price of metals in the 1980s and the overwhelming number of people who abandoned the nomadic life forced the Mauritanian authorities to look to the sea. Traditional fishing is an example of how civil society, in Africa too, is able to survive spontaneously and cooperatively despite difficulties. Today, one third of the population of Nouakchott makes its living directly or indirectly from the activity generated by the port. If traditional fishing is an example of social survival, Bamba Fall is a survivor of his own personal struggle. The Fall family is from the lowest caste among the Wolof, the ethnic group to which they belong. Of captive origin, they are traditionally bound to the hardest labor. His interest in learning French and in furthering his education broke the bonds of this caste system. In today's Mauritania, still dominated by racial and class conflicts, hundreds and thousands of men and women dedicate their lives to fighting for freedom. Bamba Fall is one of them. From his job in the Union, he works to inform the fishermen of their rights. Sabir Tal is like a father to me. He is also the imam of the mosque in the port and the oldest active fisherman in Mauritania. He has 15 children and four wives. Old Sabir, I would like you to tell me what fishing was like when you arrived here and about the fishermen's problems today. When we first came here, there were no modern materials to fish with. But there were lots of fish. I remember that we went out to sea for short periods and returned with the boat full. Around 1960, we started to buy motors in Senegal and fishing became easier. In recent years, we've suffered the arrival of big ships and the fish are disappearing. Before, we didn't have to go very far off the coast. Now, each time we have to go farther out to fish. Furthermore, the price of the machines goes up while the price of fish goes down. Most of the men who work in the port are very young. Tell me, what kind of education do your children receive? Our fathers educated us to be accustomed to life on the sea. Our children have never had problems with anyone because you'll never find the son of a true fisherman in a police station. If you want your child to have a good education, you have to bring him here, to this fishing village. Look at these boys with the nets. None of them is rude or a thief. If you get up early in the morning, go to work and come back late and very tired, you'll never feel like robbing or bothering anyone. Sabir Tal is not only the oldest fisherman here and the imam of the mosque, he is also a man who, like Bamba Fall, has fought and still fights for the rights of the fishermen. He knows that it is not easy to fight against the people who control the country, but he has no doubt about the causes and consequences of his problems. There are some people who call themselves fishermen and create fictitious companies to get financial aid. They don't know what it means to be a fisherman. There are others who do know like the Imragan, or the solitary fishermen who work along the coast. They're the ones who fish for real. We spend our whole lives fishing. We are truly a fishing people. Those people you're looking at with their boxes are waiting to fill them with fish because that's their only hope. Their whole family depends on that box. 
According to United Nations statistics, 80% of productive labor in Africa falls on women's shoulders. Thanks to them, this intricate labyrinth of ethnic groups, languages, and cultural mixtures still stands on its feet, despite the difficulties. In traditional fishing, the men work out at sea, but on land, it is the women who are in charge of handling and selling the fish. This is the most influential person in the market. Her name is Madame Bamba. She buys 90% of all the manta ray and shark that is caught in the country by traditional methods. The fishermen come to sell from all over, from as far as the Arguin Bank in the north. She salts the fish, dries it, and exports it in large shipments that she sends to Ghana once a month. In addition to receiving those who offer their merchandise in her drying room, Madame Bamba walks along the beach every morning in search of the best catches. Prices vary daily, and she negotiates in person. It may seem amazing, but 80% of the jobs that come from the sea in Mauritania have their origin in traditional fishing. With her exports to Ghana, Madame Bamba alone creates work for 500 people. Around her and the hundreds of women who work on the beach, a series of small interrelated jobs are being done that give life to this market. The business of fresh or frozen fish for export is in the hands of the Arab oligarchy. The few attempts on the part of the fishermen to form cooperatives have failed because the large groups in power boycott them. Enterprising initiatives like Madame Bamba's are only possible because she works with fish considered second rate and because of the indefatigable courage with which she faces her problems. Furthermore, the drying and salting of fish is an ancient and traditional technique. For refined palates, it seems antiquated and less than sanitary. But here in West Africa, people love to eat fish this way. And as it happens, for millions of Africans, it is the only fish they have access to. Madame Bamba knows that and takes charge of satisfying that need. Okay, bye bye. While their parents work, children go to the Quranic school that the fishermen themselves provide in a corner of the port. In a country that allots more than 20% of its budget to military spending, systematic education is a privilege available only to a minority. The Quranic schools, directed by Muslim holy men called Mataboots, partially make up for these deficiencies. In them, the children learn grammar, math, and the basic religious tenets of the Quran. But in the modern world, which is also changing at a dizzying rate in Mauritania, this education is not enough. Only those parents willing to make an economic sacrifice can send their children to secondary school, and rarely do they send their daughters. The girls stay at home preparing to become docile wives. Most do not continue their studies. Even today, the ruling social norms force girls into arranged marriages at the age of eight or nine. In the year 2001, only 3% of Mauritanian women have managed to avoid these marriages. These children reciting surahs from the Quran have a life expectancy of 45 years. Only 45 years to fight for a more just and supportive world than that their parents have known.
Moduti Ham is the blacksmith in the port. Most of the anchors, hooks, and other metal riveting used in fishing come from his forge. to see him nearly every day. Mulu, tell me, where did you learn your trade? My father taught me in Senegal. I started to work there and then I moved to Mauritania. Thanks to this profession, I built my house and could also get married. It's a job that fulfills me because I do it with my own hands. It's a family tradition that goes way back. I make anchors and hooks like these for the fishermen. I take the iron from anywhere. I recycle all kinds of objects that they bring me. Nothing is thrown away here. I can use a piece of a car, an abandoned iron beam. It's all useful to me. Tell me about your son Abdul. Does he go to school or is he only learning the profession here with you? He's not in school right now because it's vacation time. The day school opens again, he'll go back to study. When it's closed, I prefer to have him here with me. Otherwise, he fights with his friends. There's no one to watch him or take care of him on the street. No one to give him advice. He only obeys his parents. Besides, if he does well in school, which is what we all want, good. But if he fails, it would be better for him to know this trade. Then do you consider yourself a lucky man? Are you happy with your life? Yes, very happy. I have worked as hard as I had to and my family has all it needs. To sell more or less is now a question of luck. God has given me everything I have and it is him I thank. We are almost self-sufficient in the port. We have our own docks, and the carpenters who build the boats work on the same beach. The wood comes from the boats that are no longer serviceable, and the blacksmith forges nails from the remains of the large ships that run aground along the coast. The rest is pure will. are fixed up and freshly painted. They keep their old names, but they get a new wardrobe. Old retired fishermen comprise a very special group. They remain very active. We don't stick them in a corner. Rather, we take advantage of their knowledge and experience in order to continue what they have left us. In the traditional fishing market, they have their place, a space where every afternoon they gather to talk about the problems that worry them. Their opinion is law for us. When I worked as a fisherman, I was also a teacher for the little children. When I finished work, I'd go to the school to teach a class. That was in the south, where I was born. Later, I came up here and continued doing the same thing. There was no one here. We had to build everything from scratch. When we arrived, there were more jackals in this place than people. 
We have managed to survive without anyone's help. And we are proud of this. If someone loses his house, everyone gets together and helps him build another. But I want you to tell me, what happened to the cooperatives? Before, we used to have an organization and a representative who went to the capital to negotiate with the government. But all kinds of pressures forced us to stop. Now we don't have anything. They don't want us to be united. Sometimes people appear who offer us aid. And God knows where that aid goes. The fishermen are profoundly Muslim. Sincere and devout Muslims who diligently perform their five daily prayers and whose highest aspiration in life is to be able to go to Mecca someday. The Islam practiced in West Africa is moderate and syncretic. This mixture of animist traditions and Sufi intellectualism has produced a practice dominated by fetishes and idiosyncratic holy men, which is vigorously rejected by Muslim orthodoxy. Everything is written in the verses of the Quran. Prayer is obligatory for Muslims. Only prayer and solidarity among us can help us overcome our difficulties. There are fishermen who go out to sea and never come back. They die. There's no explanation for this. It's God's will. Sometimes husband and wife argue, and little by little, this becomes a very big problem. What began as a minor problem turns into a family tragedy and ends in divorce. This is not God's will. This is our fault. We should be united and trust in God. That is the way. My dear teacher Sabir Tal is one of those old Africans who, when they die, will take centuries of experience with them. At midday, when the sun is at its highest and the fishermen are still out at sea, the people of the port take a break. It's hot and all one can do is wait. The Mauritanians are one of those peoples who excel at useless ceremonies. They are masters of marvelous strategies to pass the time. The theater of life in Mauritania wouldn't be complete without the card games and the interminable rounds of tea. There's no gathering without cards, nor a silence that is not broken by the bubbling of boiling water on the fire. play, you drink, and you sing. There's no wealth here, there never was, but there's enough to celebrate the daily struggle as a triumph of life. The worst years of drought have passed. Also gone are the days of abundant fish. The will to fight to survive has remained, the courage to look the future straight in the eye. By dusk, Madame Bamba has enough fish and is completing her monthly shipment to Ghana. We already know how you treat the fish with salt. Now I'd like you to tell me if it is difficult for you to work on the beach with the fishermen. 
No, it's not difficult. I have a good relationship here with the fishermen. When they need money for gasoline, I lend it to them. Or even for family problems or other matters, I also lend it to them. A few days later, they pay me back. I always have a lot of fish, and that is thanks to the trust between us. All of the fishermen know me and respect me. Salam alaikum. Come work. Come work. Salam alaikum. Wahai. Fifteen. Say fifteen. Okay, you're right. Fifteen. Fifteen. Ah, fifteen bucks. Yeah. You're right. You work here on the beach. Who takes care of your children and the cooking at home? In my house, I cook. A girl helps me, but I always do the cooking. And I also take care of my children. I have six, three live in Ghana, and the other three live with me. The oldest helps me here with the fish business. My husband lives in Ghana. He's very old. He comes for a week, makes sure that everything is the way he likes it, and then he leaves again for three months. I take care of the business and the house. I like to watch television and listen to the music from Ghana, but I don't have time to. This work is very tiring and I get very, very worn out. Are the women of the port supportive of each other? Yes, yes. We all work together, the women and the fishermen. When someone needs help, the rest of us come to their aid. Before, nobody sold the fish here. I was the first to do it, and I have taught all the others who work with me now. The sea has no borders. It is enormous, and the big ships can go wherever they like. It is they who enter our territory. We had an accident a while ago and our ship turned over. There were 21 people inside. All of the fishermen in small boats were in the same area. We were fishing calmly for two or three hours. When dusk fell, some of the boats left, but we stayed on until night. We had gone a long time without sleep. We were exhausted. Furthermore, we hadn't caught much fish. At such times, our work is hard, and you return to land only to drop off the fish and then immediately go back out for more. That night it started raining, and when it rains, you have to stop fishing. So, we tried to rest until the next day. But they're inside, in the boat, on the sea. I saw a light that was coming towards us. We felt the noise of a ship that was coming on very fast. We didn't know what to do. We tried to start up the motor, but we were so nervous that the starting cord broke. Then we had no choice but to sit down and trust in God. Some people jumped into the water to escape swimming. Luckily, our fellow fishermen were nearby and those who jumped in could reach their boats. The rest of us didn't want to abandon ship. A motor is very expensive. We stayed there watching and praying that the monster would pass by without hitting us. But it didn't turn out like that. The ship came straight for us, struck and ran us down. We dove into the water. Most of us were lucky enough to grab hold of a piece from the shipwreck. I felt so angry. I felt an immense powerlessness. I couldn't do anything for anyone else. Our strength failed out of fear and exhaustion, and many of us didn't know how to swim. Besides, it was in the middle of the night and we'd been working all day. When a boat arrived to save us, we climbed up and I started to ask, are we all here? Were we all saved? Yes, they told me. I shouted their names one by one. If someone didn't answer, I repeated his name louder. When I finished the list, three hadn't answered. Right away, I knew they had died. 
After a morning of hard work, the fishermen see the fruits of their labor and they vigorously pull in the net, knowing it is full of fish. These are tenacious and proud men who only weeks before survived a shipwreck and today celebrate their reunion with life. Despite the pressure that the large ships have put on the sea, despite the pillage, the Mauritanian coast still thrives with fish. But let there be no doubt about it, 10 years ago the catches were much bigger. How much longer can it hold out? The return to the beach is a moment of great satisfaction. On a good day, they bring in more than a ton of fish. But even under the best of conditions, on a day like today, this hard work does not provide the fishermen with more than minimal sustenance. A fisherman earns a modest three US dollars from a full shipload like this. The owner, usually one or several of the fishermen, gets a little more, just enough to pay for the gasoline and the wear and tear on the equipment. A motor costs about $1,500 and a boat close to $1,100. Often, when the fish get scarce along the nearest coast, the ship captains organize fishing expeditions on the high seas that last between seven and 10 days. They use the same boats, but the conditions are much tougher eating, drinking, and sleeping inside the boat, at the mercy of the wind, and in danger of being run down by the commercial ships. Up until 1982, the fishermen received some aid. Then the aid changed hands, finally ending up in the hands of the nouveau riche, who have put together their own fleets with the subsidies. They have no experience. They don't respect contracts or the norms that have always ruled fishing. Only a small part of the fish that is produced on the traditional market is sold for export. The rest is sent in cars to the interior of the country. The cars used to transport the fish aren't exactly new. When a vehicle in Europe is deemed ready to be sold for parts, in Africa it has another 20 years of life. And when, after those 20 years have passed, it has drawn its last breath, recycling allows for its reincarnation as a cart, a coffee pot, or the nails to build ships. All those things that no longer work in Europe end up in Africa. Africans resuscitate objects, bringing them back to life with all the know-how and inventiveness that comes from necessity. It's the moment of the mechanic's magic, in Africa, everyone has an opinion. Only one person works, and the rest watch. But when the magic also fails, there is no other option but to turn to more traditional methods. As at sea, one person shouts, and the rest push. At dusk, all activity stops, and the universe of this city within a city dozes off in accordance with the day's rhythm. Tomorrow will not be another day. It will be the same. The same faces, the same difficulties, and the same will to survive. I've devoted my life to working with the men of the sea at Nouakchott Port and all along the coast.
we will travel to the north of the country along the narrow corridor of sand and water that all vehicular traffic uses when the tides are low. Right now, and until the Algerian routes of Insala and Taman Rasset are open again. This is the only road that connects North Africa with Sub-Saharan West Africa. I have lived and worked with various communities of traditional fishermen all along this coast. Most of them have been the sole inhabitants of these lands for centuries. The rest have come over the past few decades. Mohamed Levy is one of the many solitary fishermen who live and work along the Mauritanian coast. He is from Atar in the inland desert, but his love of adventure and wide horizons made him leave the nomadic life 15 years ago, and he moved to the sea to live as a fisherman. His family, his wife and three children, live in Nouakchott. He spends two thirds of the year alone by the sea. Mohamed Levy does not know how to swim. He mostly fishes shark and manta ray, which he later sells to Madame Bamba. The shark fins go to Chinese merchants who export them to their country. I'm here to work, but my heart is in the country. I miss my family. But I go to Nuwakshat two or three days each month to sell fish, and I see them there. I almost never go into the interior, but I do remember the desert sometimes. One can live with dignity here, but it is hard. It has its good and its bad moments. Sometimes whole weeks pass without a single catch, and other times I can't keep up with all the fish. There are no fixed rules. You have to be alert and wait for your chance. I spend hours watching the nets in the sea, looking for signs that the fish have decided to come near the shore. I don't receive any kind of aid. Around here, there are other fishermen who work like I do, and we support each other. We help each other. No one knows that we're here. Only God knows. The radio is the only way we have of staying in touch with the outside world. I listen to the news and to music. Music's what I enjoy the most. Towards the north, parallel to the coastline, the meeting of water and sand is even wilder, more violent, and dominated by a precise and brutal beauty. From Cape Timorist, one enters the so-called Arguin Bank, an area of shallows that occupy the former estuary of a dried up river. Since 1976, it has been a national park protecting the millions of birds that arrive each winter from places as far away as Europe or Siberia. It is a hard land facing a rich sea, and it is as fragile as a baby. A land whose human landscape has barely changed over the centuries. The Imragin, the only fishermen who have always lived along the Mauritanian coast must also navigate the contradictions of these modern times. They are protected by park laws, but these same laws also prevent them from joining the modern world. Ahmed Uma is one of the 88 in Ragen who live in Arguin Bank National Park. Today, as every morning, he has risen at sunrise to eke out his daily living. Fishing is the only way of life authorized by the park laws, and only under certain strict conditions. The first Portuguese navigators who explored around here spoke of the Imragen. Until very recently, the Imragen were slaves of the Gulatsbach, nomads dedicated to shepherding camels. The nomads weren't especially fond of fish, but they traded in it, dried and salted, 
and they transported it down to the south, where it was in greater demand. They were the first to trade with the Christians, also offering them ostrich feathers or gold in exchange for gunpowder. Times have changed, but the relationships are still similar. Most of the Gulatsbach have abandoned the nomadic life and now occupy privileged positions in the government or in the modern economy, while the Imragen continue in a subtle relationship of servitude towards their former masters. The fishing method used by the Imragen is very traditional. On the beach, the men look for a school of fish. They proceed with discretion, in silence, stalking their prey like true cats of the sea. The teams tend to be made up of six men. Three of them work in the water dragging the nets. The other three stay on shore. While some surround the fish, others beat the water driving them into the net. It must be a quick and coordinated action, perfectly timed, so that the fish cannot escape, except into the nylon net. The Imragen have always fished this way from the shore. The use of boats with lateen sails is recent and was introduced by sailors from the Canary Islands at the end of the 19th century. There is an ancient legend spread by the naturalist Jacques Cousteau, according to which dolphins help the Imragen make their catches. It's said that the men communicate with them in a secret language and that the dolphins follow their instructions and lead the fish into the nets. Unfortunately, it's only a legend. It's true that the fishermen often observe the dolphins to locate the large schools of fish, but that's all. species most often caught by the Imragen. Since they move in large groups and very close to the shore, they are easier to catch, although the fishermen don't get much in return. Mullet is not valued on international markets and can only be used for home consumption on the national market. seem to live in a time bubble, in an idyllic and romantic universe. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Behind the appearances, there is conflict. The Imragen suffer from the same problems as other peoples who live within protected spaces. How does one respect their right to progress and still protect the environment? These people live on a daily basis the intense dilemma of a traditional culture as it faces the challenges of modern life. Can progress be balanced with a respect for identity, with the right of all peoples to preserve their culture, and with mankind's need for its diversity to be preserved? Oh, 
in here. And then here we need you Yeah, Baba. Yeah. We live under many restrictions. We can only use certain kinds of nets. We are not allowed to use motors or to fish for more profitable catch, such as shark or manta ray. We know that it is for the good of the park, but we don't receive any compensation in exchange for this. And can you earn a good living under these circumstances? They prohibit us from using motors and then no one controls the coast. So boats from outside enter the park and do everything that we are not allowed to. Our hands and feet are tied. It is impossible for us to get ahead. And the fish continue to disappear because no one is controlling the people who are really depleting the stock. Ah. During the weeks of filming, Bamba Fall kept talking to us about a place that both disturbed and fascinated him. It was the island of Arguin, a modern reincarnation of the Republic of Women, the governesses and midwives who use men as breeders and laborers. I've always liked to come to this place. Not because it's especially attractive, because it's not, but because of the strength of the women who live here. The island of Arguin is located on the northern end of the nature reserve, close to the Cape Blanc Peninsula and the city of Nuaribu. It's an inhospitable, out of the way place where nature shows no mercy for the weak. Until well into the 20th century, only a few Portuguese sailors and small colonies of fishermen ever dared to live here, although they all soon emigrated to less cruel lands. In the 15th century, the Portuguese built a fort here, and Mrs. Embarca and her daughters built the town of Agadir on the ruins of that fort. Nowadays, about 100 people live here, all the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of this great matriarch. She belongs to the Barakala tribe, considered a warlike people who possess magical powers. When she settled on the island, she did so with a handful of men who served as lovers and laborers. Her energy and strong personality helped her to win everyone's respect and to build a village where once there had been only a few rocks. When I arrived, the lady, now in her 80s, was very ill, and it was impossible to see her. But her daughters, nieces, and granddaughters received me with warmth. I would like to know when you arrived here and how you first organized yourselves. My mother and my aunts arrived here the same year that they put the rails down in the mines. I suppose that the white men who did it know the exact year. I think it was in 1962. They moved in with tents, and the first thing my mother did was to put the old water deposits built by the Portuguese back into working order. Then, between us all, everything got done, bit by bit, with a lot of hard work. What is your relationship with the men who live with you? We are all equal here. We set the rules and decide when something should be done. But when it comes to doing the work, we all pitch in the same, regardless of sex. Some of us have husbands, others are single, divorced, or have been married several times. The most important thing in Agadir is to have a lot of children so that the village grows. That is the most important thing, to have many children. When she arrived here, our mother had several lovers who followed her from the village where they had lived before. She was always strong in order to achieve her goals, and the main one was to procreate and to inculcate in us the same strength. My daughters and the daughters of my nieces are being brought up in the same way. Our 
our trip along the northern coast of Mauritania is almost over. We have seen 400 kilometers of a wild and beautiful sea coast, of a stunning land, and of a people left to God's mercy. And to conclude, the ship's graveyard in Wadibu, a very special spot, a symbolic setting, a place that has been created as a sinister metaphor for the Mauritanian Sea. The city of Nwadibu, known in colonial times as Port Etienne, was developed during the 1980s to house the facilities that were supposed to promote the fishing industry. But pressures of all kinds, abuses and shady dealings have been the general tendency of this development. One of the consequences has been the abandonment of ships all along the coast, but especially in the Bay of Nwadibu. Sometimes the ships had suffered some damage or run aground. Other times they had accumulated unpaid fines. In any event, a surprising junkyard of nautical waste has been created over time. On the surface, there are more than 100 ships. Underwater, there are close to 1,000, they say. It's a tragic and beautiful setting, an aesthetic of rusty perversity, a place that reflects the contrast between the commercial fishing industry and the traditional fishermen, the predominance of steel over survival and solidarity.